I want to read to you Isaiah 40, reading from verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, cry out, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. But the word of our God stands forever. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. The voice, a lone voice. A lone, lone voice crying in the wilderness. Crying, not just crying, but crying plaintively in the wilderness. And the wilderness, it obviously represents a spiritual desolation. And indeed, that is what we're seeing around us in this day and age. And there is a voice. There is a voice, and it's very much a lone voice. There's a lot of noise out there, but there's very much a lone voice. A lone voice that is crying amidst all that very, very plaintively, in this spiritual desolation. And that voice is crying the same message. Prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Isaiah wrote about that a long, long time ago. Nothing has changed. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Profound, utterly prophetic, and indeed the words of Isaiah and the words of God. I want to read to you too, Malachi, Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. The prophet Malachi. He spoke of a voice that would turn or try to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. And he said, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And it's not for today. I'm not going to talk about that today. But I think it's rather interesting that if we talk about a a curse and, and maybe Uh, see its application, we see that there is a worldwide sort of anti-father conspiracy that is out there, whether it's in the soapies or whatever. You see it on a continuous basis. Anyway, we're talking here about a voice, a plaintive voice in the wilderness. And realistically, symbolically, and doctrinally, It will be that way. Whether we want to believe it or not, it will be that way. It will always be a lonely voice crying in the wilderness. It will always be a lonely voice crying in the wilderness. And God's truth 
will always be regarded as backwards and unnecessary in a hedonistic, humanistic, money-crazed, power-mad world. It is a timeless message that will never, never change. And it's always will be about making straight in a desert the highway, the narrow road. And let me just add to that, I want to read to you now, again out of Luke, around the same thing. Now in the fifth, Luke chapter 3, now in the 50th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of Eteria, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching and uh, the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of Isaiah, the prophet saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low, and the crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places will be made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people looked at him and asked him, saying, What shall we do? Verse 15, Now as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, Indeed, I baptize you with water. But one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And with many other exhortations, he preached to the people. God chose John the Baptist. John chose, was chosen by God to be the greatest. He was chosen to be the herald of the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The immutable, meticulous God will continue with the same simple, straightforward message as a stricken, godless world prepares for the second coming. It will be exactly the same. The second advent, as we call it, the second coming, parousia, however you want to view it, is the fulfillment of all Scripture. It is the fulfillment of all prophecy. The Lord Jesus Christ, He will reign, He will rule, and every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that He is the Lord. It will happen because thus says the Lord, and it will happen God's way, not our way in any shape or form. God chose John. John was chosen as his witness, born in the Spirit. We know, too, that God chose his church. His church, his real church, 
as his chosen witness, also again, born in the Spirit, and born in the Spirit, B-O-R-N-E, in the Spirit. Born in the Spirit and continued in Spirit. The real church is alive and exceedingly well, not to be confused by what you see all around. The church age was born on the day of Pentecost, and the church age will end with the rapture, however you want to see it. It will end there. It, will, it began at Pentecost, and it will finish when God ordains. And I sense, I do sense this, that as we look around, people have all sorts of opinions, and there's all sorts of deceptions around. I do believe that in many respects, there is a bit of a remnant revival going on. A remnant revival. Please hear me, a remnant revival which I would underline as a quality, not a quantity event. A quality, not a quantity event. In the church today, I sense that there is an excitement, that there is an urgency, because what is going on out there is a winnowing. It's a winnowing as it is mentioned there. It's a winning. It's a revival of quality. And it's time to play no more games. In the world that we live in, it's a world of chaos. It's a world of hopelessness. People are gridlocked in fear and desperation. They're shaking their heads. Mind-boggling statistics are coming all the time. And the bottom line is that it has confirmed for us absolutely and utterly that man has lost control. There's no doubt about it. Democracy has run amok. Democracy has run, run amok, and it's a mess worldwide. It is an absolute mess. Apocalyptic times for sure. There's no doubt about it. But there's good news. There's good news for the believers in all that. Rapture, wedding feast, whatever you want to argue about, but it's there. Whatever will be, will actually be. There's no doubt about it. And that will be good news for the believers. Absolutely good news. Amen. And even the bad news for believers is good news. The good news is that the bad news is good news. It really is. There will be a tribulation. A tribulation is going to precede the return of Jesus Christ. It's going to happen. No question about it. And you will see all around the place arrogant, disinterest, apathy, even resistance to the things judgmental. You will see all that. But it's exciting because it's as in the days of Noah. Absolutely and utterly. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. As in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day of Noah entered the ark, and he did not know until the flood came and took them away. So it will be with the coming of the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. And you know that a shaming damning truth is that the true prophetic voices are recognized in these days by the resistance and disinclination to listen to them. And that in this, in this day and age, the shaming, damning truth are that the true prophetic voices are recognized today only by the resistance or the disinclination to listen to them. And that's all absolutely biblical. It's spot on. The Bible spoke about deception and a total disinterest in the truths of God. And that is what we are seeing. On the other hand, there is bad news. Plenty of it for the unbelievers. Tribulation and suffering for the unbelievers. It's there. And it's bad, bad news. Those who don't make the cut, the left behinders, there's just bad 
news. And every one of them will get to a point one day of understanding that it was the ultimate no-brainer to reject Jesus Christ. That it is the ultimate no-brainer of no-brainers to reject Jesus Christ. Because one day you will find that you don't just die, you actually go to hell. You don't just die. One day you are going to hell. And the exciting part for us is that it's time for the John the Baptist Church. It's time for the John the Baptist Church. That same spirit that raised John. What we do not need is a false preach them happy, preach them rich church. Prophets, false prophets promising peace and goodwill and financial prosperity to all. Friends, it's time for the plow in the fallow ground. That is what is needed now. Time for the John the Baptist church. It's time for us to see that truth, the John the Baptist truth in this day and age. Let's look at John. God raised John. Most of us know there's a very small part in the Bible about John. Such a great man was raised, but so little is written. But some of the very, very interesting facts, he was born six months before Jesus. He was born six months before Jesus, and when he heard that Jesus was coming, he leapt in his mother's womb. That was John the Baptist. He was, too, a select group of biblical giants with barren mothers. He was a very select group of them. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Samuel, Samson, and John the Baptist. A very select group. Have a look at that. A really select group. He was also uh, a, a, a Nazarite. He lived in the desert. He lived in the desert. He was prepared in the desert. He was prepared outside the world, not in the world. You can't be prepared in this world for the world. He was prepared outside. He was prepared and, and he was sustained outside. He was sustained by locusts and honey. He was in the world. No, and he was not of the world. He was absolutely that. He was also a select group of heralded births. Not only did he have a barren mother, but very few were actually heralded. Their births were heralded. Isaac again, and Samuel, and Jesus, and John the Baptist, and Samson. Sure, when you look at all those things, holiness was a big issue, a major league issue. And what is holiness? Holiness is separation unto God. Holiness isn't about halos and harps, and a good CV. It's a very, very simple thing. Holiness is separation unto God. Righteousness is only in Jesus Christ, absolutely and utterly. And there he was, taught by God in the wilderness, prepared by God in the wilderness. The only people who can be prepared for this job in hand are the people God has prepared. Man can't prepare us for what's up in the months and years that lie ahead. Only God. You can only truly be prepared like in the wilderness, separated in holiness to understand what it's all about. Holiness isn't just a word you read in the Bible. It's a reality. It's an attitude. It's all those things. It's a way of life. It ensures that there's no contamination from the world. I mean, we're supposed to be salt. And we know that salt, salt can't lose its, its saltiness unless it gets contaminated. 
And so easily we are contaminated in this world. We, and the worst part about it is that we actually don't believe that we're getting contaminated. We've got so used to getting contaminated. It's all just part of the deal. And there he was too, when you look at him, he looked a bit like Elijah. I never saw either of them, but I just gather from what I read. He looked a bit like Elijah. Long hair and leather belt. He stuck out. And God's men will stick out like Elijah and John the Baptist. Probably wouldn't be let in to most churches in this day and age. But there's something in that we need to understand. And he spoke radical words. He spoke radical words in a radical language. So, can you imagine the response to him? The strong language that he used. People would more modernly, they would look at him and say, well, you know, that can't be of the Holy Spirit. There's no ways. I mean, just listen to him. Where's the love? He's calling everyone a brood of vipers. He was only quoting Jesus. Jesus had said exactly the same things. You can go and check in Matthew 23 where the Lord used similar phrases. The Lord spoke about, he called them fools and serpents and hypocrites and blind guides and sons of hell and whitewashed tombs. In other words, John the Baptist, the sky's the limit. Help yourself. Sure. And the message, the message was loud and the message was clear. We are sinners. We are sinners. And he targeted the Pharisees. He targeted the Pharisees. So did Jesus. So did Jesus. Hypocrites. Jesus had a problem with the Pharisees. And you don't have to beat around the bush. You see it's there classically written out for us. And then he said, bear fruit worthy of repentance. He said, a simple bottom line, when Jesus comes into your life, your life changes. When God comes into your life, your life changes. No change, no Jesus, no God. Bear fruit. Fruits of change. True decisions bear fruit. No change, no Jesus. John also likened Jesus to a winnowing fan, thoroughly cleaning out the threshing floor. He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. What part of that don't we understand? The axe laid to the root. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. How did they respond like they always respond when the Holy Spirit is in action, when the Holy Spirit is bringing His Word? The bottom jaw drops and they say, what must we do? That's what happened at Pentecost. What must we do? And you know, it's interesting, John said all these things even before he'd met him. So that also shows us how he had accurate, by the Spirit, accurate insight straight to the throne room of Almighty God. He baptized Jesus. And then ministry, his ministry was over. The mighty man of God met a sordid, absolutely bizarre end. There were no last-minute attempt to save him. Ignominious departure. And it was all rather matter-of-fact, almost seemingly impersonal and certainly downright unfair. And Jesus didn't break down. You see, it was all in the script. Like everything else, it's all in the script. It 
some profound issues. I think this is one of the most profound things. He said, I can't even tie his shoelaces. That wasn't just a clever little one-liner. I can't even tie his shoelaces. There were no false illusions. He realized that he was wretchedly unworthy. And that's a clear indicator that the Holy Spirit has been working with you when you get to that position. It's a fruit of the Spirit in you to recognize your own unwretchedness, absolutely and utterly. A fruit we don't like to, we rather have the Galatians ones. We don't like that fruit. The Holy Spirit had been working for years with the Lord's human herald. The Lord's appointed human herald. Oswald Chambers said, true repentance causes a sense of inexpressible unworthiness. That's how the Holy Spirit works. And particularly will work in the end times here. These things will accompany us because you'll be working in it. John's attitude and understanding of his role were crystal, crystal clear. I must decrease. He must increase. No question about it. I must decrease. It's not about me at all. Please don't look at me. I must decrease. He must increase. And I can't even tie his shoelaces. That spirit needs to be in the presentation of the gospel in these end times. The spirit of John the Baptist will make that presentation. Always. Because the Holy Spirit is accurate and consistent. And there's accuracy in his doctrine. It's the same thing as the Holy Spirit. God promised that he'll make us his people. I'll put my spirit in you and you will fear me. You will have an awe for me. If my spirit is in you, you will have a fear and an awe for me. If there's no fear and awe, there's no spirit in you. I'm sorry. True leadership. True leadership is humble. And the hum humility you can't earn and you can't actually parade. Humility only comes from the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's an agape love that serves. It's not served. It serves. It, 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 it's not, it serves. It's not there about fixing up the world. It serves, and it's humble. He was happy to give everything away, give it all away. And the accuracy of his doctrine. Now his doctrine is important. So much deception these days is running around, the misuse of doctrine and the manipulation. When he said there, behold, behold, he didn't say, look, see over there. He said, behold, that means look intently. The Son of God, he didn't just say, oh, there's Jesus. He said, that's Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God, who takes away, not the sins of the world, the sin of the world. The father of all sins, and that's unbelief. That's, that's him. So, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The original sin. Unbelief. And that is the biggest sin that anyone on, on earth can commit. 
The biggest sin you will find out one day in your life is not to believe in Jesus Christ. It will be the biggest sin. Every one of us one day will come to grips with the biggest sin in our lives was not to believe in Jesus Christ. There were no signs and wonders. There was no mountaintop mania. There was a lack of healings and and, and supernatural stuff. There was no special treatment for him, no inside knowledge. There was no special encouragement for him in prison. There was no molly coddling. He said, oh, are you the one? They didn't even say yes. So tell him what I've been doing so that he can work it out that, that I am the one. And John's job was to speak the truth straight, pulling no punches, fearing no man. It cost him his head. It cost him persecution. It cost him martyrdom. But the same spirit needs to prevail in the true end time church. And it will prevail. It will be so. It will happen. Whether you want to believe it or not, or whether your doctrine has managed to allow that in or not, it's going to happen. The storm clouds are gathering. The twigs are budding. I love it when they said to him, what shall we do? I'm reminded of Pentecost that day. What shall we do? What shall we do? I mean, they just got the truth about Jesus. What shall we do? And he gave them the only answer the church has ever been given the right to give. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Repent, turn from the evil ways. Acknowledge your wretchedness and get baptized, die to self. Give up your independent right to yourself. That's it. And then you will never be the same again. Never. And it also said, he spoke there about many words. That he spoke many words. And you should hear many words. And preachers should be preaching many words. Not short little sermons. They need to be preaching many words with enthusiasm and urgency. Preach. Timothy, in season and out of season, because Timothy, there are no seasons. Just preach like there's no tomorrow. Preach it. And we see that the key to revival is locusts and honey. Yeah, locusts, we look at locusts and symbolically you can look at, they swarm, they devour, they destruct, and they they do symbolize judgment and retribution. They do. And honey, you can look at and say, well, that symbolizes God's word. And God's word is very interesting because God's word is judgment and mercy, wrath and grace, kindness and sternness all put together. It's a bit of both. All together, all at the same time. Thy rod and thy staff. I mean, that, that sounds symbolically a bit tough. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Those are the things that comfort me. I need to hear that. I need to receive that. They comfort me. I think, too, also very challenging for us to understand this is that there in the beginning of Luke chapter 3, it said there, but God, there was 
Tiberius Caesar was reigning, Pontius Pilate was governor, Herod was tetrarch, Philip was tetrarch, Lysanias was tetrarch, Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. They were all there. Those were the big deals in that day. They were. But it says there was a nice big but. But the word of God didn't come to any of them. It didn't come to any of them. The word of God came to John in the wilderness. The word of God came to John, his chosen, in the wilderness, separated to receive. God is not going to usher in his kingdom with the rich, the famous, the humanly wise, or the powerful. Just go and read Jeremiah 9, verses 23 and 24. And he said, and we need to say, stop claiming Abram. Stop it. Stop it. Stop claiming Abraham. It's not about religion. It's not about your tribe. It's not about your culture. We've got ourselves totally overawed with all that. It's not about any of those things. Stop claiming Abraham. And bear fruit. Fruit that can only come from repentance. And repentance involves weeping. Repentance involves being on your knees. Repentance involves brokenness. That's revival. That's what revival is. Regeneration. Elsewhere, we are warned. And I, it took me many years to really understand the profoundness of this warning. But when God talks about the synagogue of Satan, it's a problem in the churches, the synagogue of Satan. The big problem to understand is that the synagogue of Satan in the church are the believers who say they are believers but are not. The believers who are in fact unbelievers but they say they are believers. They are the biggest problem in the church. And indeed we're seeing that. It's not some evil guy. That is where it comes. They actually the devil's Trojan horses. And that's around too. And and the exciting part is that you can recognize them. The Trojan horses are all over the place as well. Hallelujah. God knows exactly what's going on. He hasn't lost control for one single second. And these are the absolute final truths. There's a remnant. It's a remnant. It's always been a remnant. And that's what you're seeing. It's quality. It's a quality remnant. And I do believe that's going on at the moment. There's a lot of challenging. A lot of people... Sold out Christians are spending more and more time on their knees. The remnant on its knees. The winnowing. The road is narrow. Few are saved. Who gave us the right to preach any other gospel? 